Hi, I'm Stephen Webb, host of Touring Heaven, your tour guide and traveling companion. And I'd like to invite you to come with me on a tour of heaven. This tour, we're going in our etheric bodies to a retreat in heaven concurrent with the physical city of Darjeeling in the Himalayan part of northeast India. We'll be visiting the etheric level of the Himalayas, so expect alpine views, pine forests, snow-capped mountains around us, and a dazzling palace of light, even more impressive than the Taj Mahal. You'd be right if you're thinking this is going to be spectacular. It is, but even more important than the fabulous setting is the person we're going to see and hopefully talk to. A quick note, if this is your first episode and you haven't heard the introduction for Touring Heaven, now might be a good time to skip back to it for an orientation so you have an understanding of how we get there. Now let's get oriented for this tour. Remember when we were in Kuan Yin's Temple of Mercy in the green hills near Etheric, Beijing, and our guiding master told us that all the religions are integrated in heaven. They're all one understanding and devotion to the one God. The saint we're about to see in Darjeeling, in the Temple of Goodwill, embodies that very principle of unity. The hierarch of this heavenly retreat is the Ascended Master El Moria, who in his physical lives with us was a principled and visionary leader, lifetime after lifetime. In one of his most famous lives, this saint even tried to integrate the world's religions, here in the physical octave. It's documented in the 17th century history of India, as we'll see in a few moments. What's different about El Moria, compared to the other masters we visited, is that he ascended only 120 or so years ago. As a get-it-done kind of master, he's been engaged in recruiting and teaching and the ongoing sponsorship of his students like us every day since he ascended. In this introductory visit, we are going to Darjeeling to see El Moria. But often, this is the master who comes to you, where you are in the physical. He knows you need his unseen protection and sponsorship, even when you don't know it. He makes the effort to contact you because he knows exactly who you are, from many lifetimes of sharing the course of history and being a contemporary with him. He knows the history of your soul, your latent divinity, and that you and I have actual weaknesses and strengths he can improve and work with for the light. If you're going to lovingly trust a master, maybe like you trust a great sports coach, and try to think on his or her far-seeing wavelength every day, you'd want to know his or her credentials. What victories have they won? What teams have they been on? And what have they learned in order to become immortal and a holy teacher? If they're going to set the divine standard for your performance, your devotion, and your integrity when you're trusted with power, how have they proven themselves in the physical world? Who were they in history? What did they do when they were in positions of power and responsibility? We're going to Darjeeling in just a moment to meet the master and to ask about who he was in history. I happen to know that there are many brothers and sisters of light in a holy order there who would be happy to share some background with us on the master's previous lives. El Moria himself is more interested in our present and future engagement with the fire of God waiting to unfold within us. But he does understand how important it is for us to know how he was tested by God many times in every life and how he's more than earned the right to teach us. Oh, and there's one more thing you should know. El Moria respects doers. People of light who, like him, want to get things done right, because that's how civilization evolves. So, are you up for this? A visit with the coach? The key is to observe the master. You can figure out his standards by watching and listening and looking for the twinkle in his eye and his sense of humor. This is the master who, when things in the world are difficult, says a twinkle of mirth is needed on earth. El Moria knows timing and pacing, when to lighten up and when to chivy along the doers and the dreamers so good things actually get done on time. Like the master, we're about right action too. So with our hands holding on tight to our blue and white angel escorts, we're up and on our way in our etheric bodies to the snowy Himalayas. 
By the speed of thought, we're high over the etheric level of the Himalayas and looking down on pine forests on the steep hills around Darjeeling. It's daytime here. And there's the Temple of Goodwill, set in gardens surrounded by forest, with snow-capped mountains behind. The thick walls are a glistening, brilliant white, closer to Moorish architecture than Indian. We can see that it's huge. It's a square complex with four grand minaret towers, one at each corner, and with an unusual dome over the center. Rather than being rounded, the dome is blue and flame-shaped. Closer to the ground, we see the white-walled gatehouse, some distance from the palace, and that's where the angels gently land. We see that the way into the beautiful walled grounds of the Temple of Goodwill is through the gatehouse. However, we see someone moving around inside behind the gates who gives us pause. An awkward figure slowly pulls one gate slightly open and stares out at us. Who are you? He's gruff and startling to look at with unkempt hair and straggly whiskers. We introduce ourselves, our minds spinning to cope with the unexpected. If this is heaven, why would a master of El Moria's reputation allow a misfit to wander into his gatehouse? How could this be? What happened to the real gatekeeper? So we ask if he is El Moria's gatekeeper. His response is another question. Why are you here? He growls, looking at us carefully. We explain we're here to see the Ascended Master El Moria, and then we wait for his next response. He looks at us, and we look at him. It's in that moment of looking that each of us is able to detect a kindness somewhere in his eyes. There's no meanness there, just a stern expression to test us, to see if we might want to ridicule him as an imposter or worse. Looking more closely, we get it that El Moria either has an interesting sense of humor or deems us worthy to be tested by the unexpected, or both. You can come in, he says, with a touch more grace, and you are welcome to the Temple of Goodwill. The Master El Moria is expecting you, and you will be tested. With a wave of the hand and a knowing glance, we're invited into the landscape grounds. and We wait on the other side of the gatehouse wondering what's next. Who will the master send as a tour guide now, and what will the next test of the unexpected be? Within a second, the unexpected strides into view from the temple side of the gatehouse. The master conducting our tour is El Moria himself. He's six foot six, upright with broad shoulders like an athlete, penetrating blue eyes, a plain yellow turban, royal blue robe, and a warm smile that confirms he does have a sense of humor. Everything about him radiates power, vitality, and authority. Yet, like a loving father, we can see in that smile, he's genuinely glad to see us. He asks about our journey, and we follow him past the immaculate gardens and ponds to the walls of the palace itself. They're massive, like a medieval castle, but glowing white in daylight, with the same superluminous appearance we've seen in the other retreats. Above us, the window openings and doorways on four levels are flame-shaped or arched and colored pale blue. Even the minaret towers have small windows and carvings that are tastefully colored light blue. The architecture is grand and magnificent, but our eyes and feelings are drawn more to the master himself walking next to us. It feels familiar to be close to him as a father figure, and that we've been here before but like in a dream a long, long time ago. We also remember that we're in the company of a holy man who's been a saint more than once and a standard-setter of integrity in our world many times over. He invites us up the grand marble stairway and into the brightly lit foyer. Ahead of us is the entrance to a large, elegantly furnished auditorium, which he, El Moria, describes as the meeting place for the leadership of the spiritual government of Earth. As there are no nationalities in heaven, just one unified brotherhood and sisterhood, there can be one main venue for the deliberation of good government. This retreat is everything the United Nations was meant to be and more, so there's a sense of awe in us about the importance of this place. In our world, there's no equivalent to the diamond-hard, precise energy of integrity and fearless authority that's in the air here. The unseen corruption in our world could never occur in this holy place. 
as we walk to the edge of the platform in the currently empty auditorium, we're walking the same marble floor where the real spiritual leadership of Earth has walked and will walk in the next few days. What's even more interesting, El Moria explains, is that it's not only Ascended Masters who attend these deliberations. Actual worldly leaders, politicians, administrators, policy experts, economists, intelligence and military hierarchy are selectively invited to these meetings in their etheric bodies. They arrive in their etheric bodies with Blue Angel escorts like we do. But think about that term, selectively invited. They are chosen, and they also get to choose whether they want the advice of El Moria and the Darjeeling Council at the intuitive level. Free will at every level of our being. But then think about how these leaders are going to be reminded about the deep deliberations here when they wake up and their conscious minds don't remember a thing. Our etheric awareness, having the higher perspective on how we weigh our life strategy, can lead our decision-making. But back in our world, our physical, mental, and emotional preoccupations and distractions can also lead. It's always your choice. Remember K-17, who I mentioned in the Arabian retreat? He's frequently here at meetings in Darjeeling. And as an Ascended Master, he can choose to also be at thousands of leadership meetings simultaneously in our world, either accepted as a trusted, visible senior staff advisor or as an invisible witness. In private, he can be invited into the offices of leaders who think of him as staff, providing accurate documents for those who aren't able to consciously remember the meetings in Darjeeling. But I think you might understand that not every political or business or religious leader chooses to cooperate with heaven. Over El Moria's shoulder, we notice a bright light glowing on the raised altar at the back of the wide platform. Everyone seated in the auditorium would see this light and focus on it. Only in heaven could you see a large, pale blue diamond with a white flame alight in its center, and around the central white flame, a slightly larger, delicate blue flame flickers all around it all still inside the great diamond. And then three stately figures dressed in royal blue robes and light blue sashes come up the stairs to the platform, approach the altar, and stand still in reverence. El Moria acknowledges them and guides us along the aisles to the far upper end of the auditorium. As we walk, he quietly explains that he is the hierarch of a holy order in the Temple of Goodwill, known as the Brothers of the Diamond Heart. And as a holy order of ascended beings, sons and daughters of God, they are conductors for all humanity of the frequencies and vibrations of the aspects of God that establish and maintain effective organization and good government in our world. They have the holy office and God-given authority to command and direct Archangel Michael and the Blue Angels or angels of the first ray, to deliver aspects of divine energy into the presence of the Christ selves of all who create and manage successful organized movements, including governments. These engrafted energies of the word are directed to convey, through the radiance of angels, the will of God for envisioning, planning, organizing, developing, and implementing ideas, solutions, and policies in every nation. It hadn't occurred to us that this would needed all possible. El Moria reminds us that the nations have free will to choose anarchy and self-destruction or a golden age, the difference between cavemen and civilization. And the feeling behind these energies of the will of God is great compassion for humanity and concern for our welfare. The nature of the first ray energy is strength, courage, determination, protection, and the standard of perfection. Leaders and members of groups tend to go astray through political and personal distractions if they don't receive radiant reinforcement of these qualities. Those who attempt to act in good faith to further the divine plan toward the coming golden age deserve divine assistance. The three brothers at the altar are now praying aloud in unison, so we keep our distance and listen. The sound is something we don't hear often on earth. Simultaneous command and devotion to Archangel Michael, all in unison. We then follow the master's gesture out into the carpeted hallway and begin to tour the many studios and schoolrooms just off the main auditorium. El Moria explains 
But these are the actual rooms where public servants, business and elected leaders are taught between lifetimes and in their etheric bodies during sleep. We discreetly look into each room to see who's there. The master smiles when it's clear we don't recognize anyone we know from our network news. At the moment, it doesn't seem to be that busy and the few meetings going on are informal. Now, Moria tells us that all who specialize in various kinds of leadership in our world come here at one time or another, formally or informally. The best leaders are frequent travelers, renewing and refreshing their own understanding of the intricacies of the will of God in their particular area of politics, government, religion, business, finance, or education. Then, Elmoria takes us up to the second floor and amazingly shows us his own quarters, his study, his libraries, and the formal meeting rooms for members of the Darjeeling Council. And one interesting recurring visual theme here and there around El Moria's personal space are the clusters of little blue petal flowers. And we smile as we recognize them from our world as forget-me-nots. This is El Moria using the name of these humble little flowers as a visual reminder, as a plea to keep in contact with him through prayer. The hundreds of beautiful, old-looking, leather-bound books on mahogany shelves catch our attention, and it's impossible to resist touching them. Some of the titles are unreadable, at least to us, but there's no dust on them. They look new, but they can't be. The diagrams and ancient-looking prose and what seems to be mathematical treatises are written in ink as if they were original manuscripts. And when we look up, we realize El Moria is moving on with the tour. And we follow him out into a foyer and then into another auditorium on this level, large enough to seat several hundred ascended and unascended masters. This smaller auditorium, he says, is used more often each week to discuss international problems and how they can be resolved. Then we go up a beautiful blue carpeted stairway to the third floor, and carved into the white marble walls we can see blue lotuses combined with intricate carvings in Indian and Tibetan designs. And as we gaze at them, some begin to change shape. Even though these are carved into marble, they can be changed at will for functional purposes, not just as decoration. The designs come from the mind of God and are used to precipitate divine ideas into useful action in heaven as well as in our world. The designs are beautiful to look at, but we have no idea what they mean. Then there's an even bigger surprise we don't yet understand, as El Moria opens the doors to a flame room. The vibration here is an intense, even pulsation, even greater than the diamond flame in the main auditorium. Here, the walls are a sparkling, iridescent white, while the floor and ceiling are royal blue. The flame of the will of God in the center of the room is also royal blue flickering through deeper and brighter shades. The pulsing, rhythmic feeling is intense and majestic beyond words. Beneath the flame itself we can see, inlaid into the floor, a mosaic of divine geometry, also beyond our understanding. But our eye goes back to the brilliant blues of the flame because there's nothing in the physical world to compare with a steady fire that has no fuel, and yet we can feel its radiance. Not as heat, but as an intense positive feeling of protection, determination, order, vitality, and perfection. El Moria comments that the positive feeling is freely available to us in the physical world if we want it. Step down a level or two, if we ask for it, through prayer, meditation, and invocation. You have to ask for it, he says. Draw it to you. To ask for it. You have to know it exists, and it's to be used in balance with wisdom and love. For an introductory tour, there's a lot here to take in. El Morius sees this and assures us, You are welcome to come back to study what you need at a pace unique to you. And then tells us there's a fourth floor. So we take the carpeted stairway up to a spacious layout of prayer rooms and meditation alcoves by windows and then another stairway up to the roof. In the bright sunlight, we shade our eyes from the reflection of myriad iridescent tiles covering the enormous blue flame-shaped dome above us. At the far end of the roof, 
we tour an astronomical observatory and look out on the magnificent view of the gardens and forests and snow-covered mountains. Even with our hands resting on the marble balustrade on the roof, we're still pulsing in rhythm with the royal blue flame on the third floor. It's embedded in us, as if we're going to retain that powerful feeling forever as part of our own pulse. But we'd like to know more about El Moria himself. How does he have the time to meet with us when he clearly has a lot of responsibilities? Can he divide time? We appreciate his generosity and his care in showing us the retreat. But what about his reputation for being stern? He doesn't seem all that stern now. El Moria acknowledges our interest with a smile, and we follow him downstairs from the roof into a living room on the second floor with more soft blue carpet underfoot. We're invited to sit in comfortable lounge chairs in front of a cheerful fireplace as he listens to our questions. And meeting his gaze, we can sort of tell there's a twinkle in his eye as he responds, thoughtfully. For a long period of time, he says, individuals have intimated to mankind that I, Moria L., am extremely stern. This may be true in a sense that I am stern, because the first ray in itself represents the will of God. And I ask you, beloved hearts, if I, as the Chohan of the first ray, am to flinch from the will of God, then where is the foundation and basis for all that is to follow? He explains that any other master of light will verify his love for his students. And then he says, You who know the light, know that I love you. You know that I've stood beside you when you needed me, and you know that I will continue to do so as long as you revere in your hearts and minds the will of God, even when sometimes you seem to fall short of it. El Moria pauses and looks at us, a momentary smile shifting to firmness in his expression. However, I do not condone falling short of the will of God. I hope that the day will soon come when every one of you will be so firm that nothing can break you or shake you or change you. I await the day when you are ready to give your all to the light, as we have done. Now we know we live in a dangerous world on our level of earth, but El Moria's words about break you or shake you seem to resonate and we ask about it. He assures us that while there is danger in the physical world, there's no need to be over-concerned. If your attention returns to the blue flame of God regularly each day, and you ask for it to fill you with faith and protection, you avoid the people and places where there might be danger. The intensity of the heaven world interpenetrates your world when you ask for it. Then El Moria stands and asks us to rise and to accompany him to the back of the main auditorium on the first floor. We hear the swelling sounds of beautiful, powerful music before we even get to the doorway. And when the door opens by itself, the light of the blue and white diamond on the altar is more radiant than we'd seen before. Instead of three brothers of the diamond heart praying in unison, there are about a hundred brothers and sisters singing a devotional hymn, a waltz rhythm, in full voice. The effect is very moving, and within moments, there are tears in our eyes. The words about a diamond heart are in English, but being there is more about absorbing the soaring feeling of strength rather than understanding every word. Day until the echoes of the song fade away. In silence, the master ushers us out of the auditorium, and as we walk toward the main foyer and onto the grand stairway outside, he explains the ceremony we had witnessed. He says, If you recall, I spoke to you earlier, that I await the day when you are ready to give your all to the light as we have done. There are those on earth who have, over many lifetimes, made themselves ready. 
you witness the end of a ceremony which was to add impetus, the engrafted word, to the being of those who stand for the light in your world. The intensity of heaven interpenetrates earth on request. If you were to meet those of whom I speak, you would not recognize them by their appearance, but by their works. Just then two sisters of the Order of the Diamond Heart appear on either side of Elmoria. The master bows to us, smiles, and excuses himself to take care of the business of heaven somewhere else in the retreat. The sisters, in their blue robes, introduce themselves and ask if we're keeping up with the master's answers to our questions. They're impressive, regal ladies, to say the least, each having an upright bearing, yet they're friendly and informal to us. They invite us to walk along the broad pathway through the fragrant gardens, and we find, as impressive as they are to look at, they're actually comforting to be with, like El Moria. Where are the ladies like this on our level of earth, you wonder? But then, more important questions come back to mind, like, what were El Moria's previous lives that he so modestly declined to tell us about? The sisters smile, and with a glance decide which of them will begin to explain while we walk. We are permitted to describe only a few of El Moria's past lives, the blue-eyed sister says. Some of them without personal names, such as the master mason who built the great pyramids of Giza in the prehistory of Egypt. Within these known lives, the soul of El Moria was trusted with power and a lot of responsibility for people's lives. A good example was his life around 2100 B.C., as the Old Testament leader Abraham, a friend of God, a pioneer trusted as the original father figure for the lineage of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. God told Abraham that through him, God would make a great nation that would be a blessing to the world. And then in a seeming paradox, God directed Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. And when Abraham proved he was unflinching in his faith and obedience, God, through an angel, directed him at the last second not to harm the boy. So someone who is trusted with great long-term power has the right and the need to be tested in faith and obedience to God. The taller sister with brown eyes then follows on with the chronological thread of El Moria's lives. In a subsequent life, she begins as we walk under flowering trees. El Moria was one of the early influences of Athenian democracy in ancient Greece. Following that life, he was the Zoroastrian Persian king Melchior, one of the three wise men who from a great distance anticipated Jesus' birth, brought carefully considered gifts to him in Bethlehem, and wisely didn't tell King Herod where the infant was. Then, several centuries later, around 450 A.D., she continues. I can tell you that the soul of El Moria was embodied as King Arthur in post-Roman Britain, entrusted with the most powerful military in Britain at the time, as well as the inner Christian mystery of the Holy Grail. The Grail mystery is more than the symbolic cup. It's the quest to balance the God-given threefold flame in the cup of the etheric heart through service. The testing of power and principle for King Arthur was not only to win twelve battles against outer enemy kings, but to exercise discernment of spirits and not discount the enemy within the palace. Within Camelot, there were trusted relatives and dependents who were actually practitioners of black magic and witchcraft, manipulators of rumors, lies, and intrigue. These betrayers, by their willful gossip, eventually destroyed Camelot. For Arthur, outward military strength was not enough. Identifying and expelling the enemy from within was the hard lesson and principle learned. This was a bit surprising for us, to hear that El Moria in that life had not been perfect and had been at the center of, in effect, the school of hard knocks. The sisters apparently discern that we need time to think about this, and after a few moments, we want to know what happened next. Well, if we follow the timeline of both history and testing, the first sister says, picking up the thread. From 1118 to 1170, 
Elmoria was embodied as Thomas Becket, the friend of the English king, Henry II. Becket advised the king on principle not to reward him with two conflicting high offices, Lord Chancellor of England and Archbishop of Canterbury. King Henry II expected Becket to make a convenience of the two offices, mixing and breaking the laws of church and state whenever needed. And when Becket repeatedly refused to compromise the laws of England, the king shouted, Will no one rid me of this troublesome priest? Four knights took the king seriously and murdered Becket at his altar in Canterbury. In the following months, hundreds of miracles occurred across England, attributed to the soul of St. Thomas Becket. We keep going, she continues, and around 1320 to 1390, the same holy soul embodied in Russia as another saint, St. Sergius, a humble monk living in the pine forests who was recognized by a Christian bishop as a healer and holy man at a time when Russia was dominated by Tatar rulers, descendants of Genghis Khan. By 1380, age 60, Sergius was well known in Russia as a holy sage. He advised and blessed a young Moscow prince, Dmitri Donstoy, before a great battle against the Tatars at Kulikovo. The 60,000 Russians were outnumbered by more than two to one, but won the battle with timing and tactics. This victory became the beginning of the hard-won sovereignty of Russia, and St. Sergius is still known as the patron saint of Russia. If only the Russians knew they could visit him at night here in Darjeeling. I can add that the path didn't simply conclude in sainthood or patronage for one country, the tall sister offers. The testings of God for Elmoria were relentless. We know from the Akashic Records of God, three centuries later, from 1478 to 1535, he was back in England as a lawyer and administrator for the crown. He was Sir Thomas More. Again, he held the highest offices in England to help guide his dangerous friend, whose soul was now re-embodied as King Henry VIII. King Henry VIII repeated similar expectations of compromise from More concerning the laws of church and state as Henry II had. This was the repetition of the same test Henry II had failed 365 years earlier. Sir Thomas More was determined to pass the tests of integrity, selflessness, and non-retaliation. Henry VIII wanted to divorce and remarry and create a separate church under his own control. Sir Thomas More courteously refused to support his lawless monarch, again on principle, and this time the king used the courts to secure his beheading. Sir Thomas More's last words on the scaffold were, I die the king's good servant, but God's first. For us, this takes a moment to sink in, to contemplate the sacrifice of a life for a principle of integrity we have to slow down and stop. We ask, in that life, Thomas More passed his tests, but the soul of Henry didn't for the second time? That's right, the first sister answers. Let's keep walking. Then we're not talking centuries, just seven years later, by your time. In 1542, the same soul of El Moria, undeterred by the difficult end to that life in England, was reborn in India as the son of the Muslim emperor. That son grew up to be Akbar the Great. Akbar re-established the empire of his forefathers, but on principle included Hindus in the governing class, an unheard of civic innovation in the late 1500s in the Islamic world. He went further and abolished the pilgrimage tax that Hindus had been forced to pay when they visited their holy sites. This was Akbar, an innovative military leader and administrator who created enough peace in his empire to be able to launch an integrated faith of all the known religions of his time. By his mastery of all of the elements of government, he could afford to look past religious favoritism and support the latent divinity in all his people. 
It's instructive to follow the soul's maturing, she adds, as if you were learning about your own soul's history, because change indicates transcendence to higher tests. For Elmoria, from 1779 to 1852, he was back in the British Isles, embodied as the Irish poet laureate Thomas Moore. That's M-O-O-R-E, two O's. And although Moore was engaged to some extent in the political and cultural concerns of Ireland and England in that life, he focused more on offering outstanding poetic expressions of beauty, sanctity, and the encouragement of goodwill through the written word. No military or administrative testing involved in that life. Sister, she says, would you explain to them the Master's final lifetime in their world? Yes, of course. You see, it's about the state of the soul having one foot on earth and one foot in heaven. In his final lifetime, prior to his ascension, Elmoria was born as a Hindu prince in northern India a short time after his life as the poet. Like Gautama in his final life as Siddhartha, Maurya set aside ruling caste expectations of administrative rule and great family wealth to discern humanity's greatest spiritual needs and God's will for his contribution. This life was the integration of all of the tests that El Moria's soul had passed in his previous lives. Proof of courage, certainty, power, forthrightness, self-reliance, dependability, faith, and initiative at the highest levels of responsibility. As a young man in 1875, El Moria joined several other unascended masters in co-sponsoring the Theosophical Society, and after his ascension in 1899, he helped St. Germain in the 1930s with the I Am movement, and then the Bridge to Freedom in the 1950s, and then the Summit Lighthouse ongoing. His continuing vision is, with Jesus and Gautama, to sponsor the will of God for an effective spiritual freedom in your world over the next 2,000 years. The sisters pause for questions from us, but the last phrase, the next 2,000 years, is still ringing in our thoughts. The next 2,000 years would involve us and would explain the generosity of the sisters and Moria in giving us an understanding of what qualifies the Master as an immortal teacher and sponsor. While we're thinking, the two sisters turn to look across the gardens at the main stairway to the retreat. Ah, we see the master now, the first sister says. I think he may want to invite each of you to visit us again. And moments later, the master does exactly that, drawing us closer around him. You are welcome, he says, to come to our palace of light here in Darjeeling while your body is asleep safely in your homes. As often as you want, Come to our fireside, warm yourselves, and partake of our holy communion at the altar. You have your path to God as we have here. Ours is to show you what is possible. Yours is to choose what you will do with the life you have. Elmoria looks up as our escorting angels appear as a bright flurry of blue and white auras over the nearby lawns. He smiles and noticeably doesn't say goodbye, but von dir, as if he's expecting he'll be seeing us in a few days. It's apparent he has confidence in us that we'll retain some of the intensity of the blue flame from the main altar when our conscious mind wonders about an unclear dream in the morning. An instant later we rise into the air, holding onto the strong shoulder of our angel, pondering what our past lives have been like. What does he see in us, we wonder? that he would take the time to encourage us and to say we're welcome to come back any time we want. Who are we? There's a pattern of trust, faith, and generosity that we've noticed in each of the masters we've visited. We've heard often enough that we should have faith in God. Our experience in these retreats shows us that God, personified in his sons and daughters, seems to have amazing faith in us. It's that thought that there's something worthwhile in us. And we are, in our own way, like Abraham over 4,000 years ago, putting his life and family into motion across the desert 
because God told him, possibly in one of the retreats, Get out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. The soul of El Moria has been through thousands of those new beginnings, the path through the wilderness, the unexplained mission, the testing life after life. If he's done it and is offering to show us how, we can do it too in the life we've been given. Our angels don't wait around over the snowy Himalayas and at the speed of thought are taking us each in a straight line to our homes and our sleeping body. Fast forward to daylight and with no conscious awareness that we were in heaven last night, I should at least help anchor in your conscious mind that our reference source or encyclopedia for each of our tours of heaven is, of course, the Masters and their retreats. You can browse the table of contents or buy the book on AscendedMasterSpiritualRetreats.com and you can reach me there by email. I should also refer you to some other books that are really helpful if you want to know more about El Moria. Read The Chila and the Path as a starting point. Chila generally means student. Then there's a trilogy from the Master himself. Moria and You, Love. Moria and You, Wisdom and Moria and You Power. You can read the descriptions on AscendedMasterSpiritualRetreats.com. Next tour, we're back in a different part of the vast Royal Teton Retreat in Wyoming to visit Confucius teacher Lanto, the Master of Wisdom. You've heard the word, but what is wisdom? Thanks for taking this comforting tour with me to the Temple of Goodwill and into the presence of the definition of goodwill, courage, and divine protection. Knowing we're going back again and again to be trained and tested, I'm going to say with determination, always victory. <laughs>